One of my greatest pet peeves with graphics hardware reviews these days has been the insistence of media and the community in general on using peak compute in teraflops as a point of reference. The situation's gotten even worse with the release of the GTX 2000 series. We now have a new number, seemingly invented by Nvidia called RTX Ops, a completely arbitrary figure with seemingly no other purpose than to show the ultra expensive new hardware is indeed faster than Pascal, in some arcane way, assuming that hybrid ray tracing models actually become an integral part of the graphics pipeline in tomorrow's games. But before RTX Ops can completely rob hardware comparisons of any credibility whatsoever, there was the original culprit, compute measured in teraflops. The origins of this unfortunate usage can easily be traced back to 2013. Leaked presentations on Orbis and Durango, codenames for the PS4 and Xbox One, highlighted that the PS4 had a GPU with 1.84 teraflops of power, while the Xbox One's GPU had 1.18 teraflops. There's nothing that a marketing department loves more than a simple number to make seemingly scientific comparisons. Our detergent removes stains five times better than the competition, that sort of thing. With console and PC hardware, the reality is nowhere near as simple. And yet, because of the bandwagon effect, or just plain laziness, the teraflop has entered the lexicon of the gaming media. The 6 T-flop Xbox One X, the 1 T-flop Tegra X1 mobile processor, and we're completely ignoring the utterly ridiculous 70 RTX Ops 2080 Ti here. In the console space, teraflop figures are often thrown around in the discussion surrounding PS4 Pro and Xbox One X performance. This can lead to disingenuous conclusions. While it is true that the Xbox One has an objectively faster graphics component, this is just part of the story when it comes to the performance comparison. But what exactly is so wrong with using compute performance to compare graphics cards? To understand this better, we need to look into the reasons why particular GPUs run games well or poorly, and the only true objective metric here is per game frame rates. A graphics card isn't simply made up of compute units, it has a variety of other components, from video memory to texture units to ROPs and more. Each of these elements is made use of in different ways and to different extents by various games. For example, MSAA depends on a large part of the available memory bandwidth. A card like GTX 1050 3GB with more compute units than the GTX 1050 2GB but substantially less memory bandwidth may actually end up performing worse than its noticeably worse counterpart. On the flip side, having a glut of memory bandwidth, 512 gigabits per second to be precise, doesn't help the R9 Fury or Fury X due to their low ROP count, relative to the large number of shader units. The imbalance of ROP and compute units in the Fury series is evident in that, despite losing 12.5% of its compute units, the R9 Fury never performs 12.5% worse than the Fury X. With consoles, the situation is further complicated because the bottleneck is often not in the graphics component at all, but the CPU. The perfect example of this is Fallout 4. Despite the significant GPU performance gap between the Xbox One and the PS4, Fallout 4 actually ran slightly better in places on Xbox One due to the CPU clock speed advantage. CPU power was that much of a bottleneck that the teraflop difference had no impact on in-game performance. With PS4 Pro and Xbox One X, the situation is slightly different. The Pro runs the game at 1440p, while the Xbox One X runs it at full 4K. The result here is that the image quality on the One X is definitely better than on the Pro. However, performance is shakier, with more frequent drops below 30fps than on Sony's console. This is a pattern that repeats itself in many titles. The One X runs titles at higher resolution while offering lower performance. How is a teraflop gap useful in describing these situations? Game engines aren't solely compute intensive either. A variety of techniques stress various aspects of GPU hardware, and not all of these are used in all games. For example, AMD cards are known to handle tessellation worse than their Nvidia counterparts. As a result, Gameworks features that are often heavy on tessellation, such as Hairworks, work noticeably worse on AMD hardware as compared to Nvidia hardware. However, Team Reds recoups a large chunk of that deficit in games like The Witcher 3 simply by having tessellation turned off, to the extent that other advantages on the AMD hardware could help propel it past the competition, as is the case with the R9 380 and the GTX 960. 
Performance can be limited by bottlenecks in any particular component, not just compute units. And we haven't even gotten into the massive impact of driver support. Many NVIDIA cards far outperform AMD cards with a similar degree of compute performance, e.g. the RX 480 and the GTX 1070, in gaming situations while falling far behind in other situations like mining, in part due to the extra resources NVIDIA puts towards drivers. Lastly, the peak aspect of peak compute bears looking at. Due to thermal constraints or power efficiency concerns, a particular GPU may not always operate at peak performance. This is especially noticeable in the mobile space. Performance degradation is an almost unavoidable aspect of smartphone gaming, as high-end mobile GPUs lower clocks and offer more pedestrian performance to cope with the increased heat load. In many situations, a nominal peak compute figure is quoted, but in real-world scenarios, the hardware doesn't actually hit that level of performance consistently. In the console space, peak performance is less of a factor. Console hardware is purposely operated at lower clocks to guarantee consistent performance without hitting thermal or power limits. Teraflops, in general, aren't a useful figure to determine the relative performance of graphics hardware. In the console space, considering the relative architectural similarities, it is of some use to compare a rough estimate of performance differentials between the Pro and the Xbox One X in GPU-limited situations when running at the same frame rates and visual settings. However, because of the obvious desire by manufacturers and developers alike to offer parity in console experiences, it's rare that everything else remains the same. Visual settings may be tweaked, draw distances may be pulled back, checkerboard rendering may be employed, and at the end of the day, the experience on a 4K TV isn't, say, 50% better or worse, as teraflop figures would have you believe. And that about does it for this video. If you enjoyed what you watched and want to see more from Gaming Bolt, you can always hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell icon next to it. That way you will never miss any of our videos.